Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us uh, across all the various social media platforms across the country and across the world. I'm delighted that you're with us uh, in our second week of this series, The Gift of Curiosity. Can somebody say curiosity? Now, listen, if you missed last week's message, be sure to go to our website. You're going to want to engage with that message. But today, let me just take a moment uh, if you're watching this message outside of our regular online worship gathering, I just want to say a little bit what I said uh, previously, which is simply this. This message is really contextualized by our Explore God uh, campaign. And uh, for those of you who may just be learning about it, go to our website, Explore God, and you'll discover that there, there are seven basic questions that social scientists says that all of us um, re- are itching to wrestle through in one way or the other if we could find safe places to do it. And we're challenging everyone, all of you who are watching me, wherever you are across the country, across the world, whether you be in Kenya, uh, Seoul, Korea, or Alabama, and we have people watching us from all of those places, Maryland, we're challenging you to step forward and be a part of this effort. Lead what we call an Explore God discussion group. Pull together your family, your friends, loved ones, people you love and trust. Uh, It may just be you and your best friend. That's cool. And beginning the first week in October for uh, uh, seven weeks, we're going to work through those seven questions, beginning with, does life have a purpose? Is there a God? So forth and so on. Uh, Last week, we really uh, took a step forward here in the local Bay Area, in the NBCC community. Tons of people uh, step forward and say, I'm going to take a huge step of faith. I'm going to be a small uh, discussion group leader and explore God discussion group leader. I'm challenging you. I believe God is calling you to do the same. All right. Be a part of this movement that's happening here in the Bay Area and exploding beyond. God bless this teaching. In Jesus name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Can you say two words? Here they are. I wonder. Come on, say it again. I wonder. All right, let's jump into this teaching beginning with Luke chapter 1. The angel Gabriel has uh, shown up and disrupted Mary's life. Uh, Here's what the text says. Gabriel appeared to her, Mary that is, and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think. Everybody shout think. Think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He'll be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, see that? Ask the angel. But how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy. and He will be called the Son of God. And here's Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Then the angel left her. And there ends the reading. Can you say amen? Today I want to take a few moments and really unpack and dismantle three basic misconceptions that often gets in the way of us growing in our faith and sometimes are the reason why we get in the way of other people growing in their faith. The first misconception is this. Following Jesus is about blind faith. Can you say misconception? I'm sure all of us have bumped into this person somewhere along along the journey, particularly if you are a Jesus follower. It is the person who says, you know what, it's very hard for me to be a Christian because by nature I'm very skeptical and I ask a lot of questions. And my understanding is to be a Christian means that, you know, I'm just going to have to trust blindly. Well, that person is suggesting that being a Christian is all about blind faith. Perhaps she or he got that notion because they were in a Sunday school classroom somewhere, or maybe they were sitting in a Roman Catholic confirmation class, and they asked the question, and the response came back to them, uh, you should never question God. Now, I'm pushing back against that. As a matter of fact, part of what we're doing with this Explore God campaign, where we're inviting people 
of all different walks of life. You don't even have to be a Christian to host this Explore God campaign. We encourage you to engage these seven questions. And part of what we're doing is pushing back on that notion that, um, you know what, you can't question God. God welcomes and invites our questions. Listen, one of the things that I often say is this. Believing uh, faith is not believing God in the midst of answered questions. That's facts. Faith is believing God in the midst of unanswered questions. And to the credit of those who may have said, don't question God, I think what they were trying to suggest, at least the implications of what they were trying to get to, was simply this. That there will be seasons in our lives if we walk as followers of Jesus that we're going to have to walk forward in the midst of unanswered questions. But there is a difference between unanswered questions and unasked questions. You see, there are seasons that we're going to have to move forward with unanswered questions, but we can ask our questions in every season that we live. The Bible invites us to ask our questions. Notice the word curious. Can you say curious? I'm talking about in this series, the gift of curiosity. It is at the very heart of how God has shaped us and made us. And the root of that word curious actually means careful. In the original context, it meant careful, careful consideration. It ultimately evolved into being inquisitive. This is truly in line with the faith that we experience in the Bible. This is in line with the faith that comes to us through Jesus. The Bible is full of faithful people asking questions. It's not blind faith, man. It's thoughtful. It's engaging. It's rigorous. Last week, I told you that Moses started off with the question, why doesn't the bush burn up? But he ended with the questions of his heart, asking God, where have you been for the last 430 years while my people and your people have been suffering? Questions. People of faith have been asking God questions all throughout the biblical tradition. Sarah says when she hears that she's supposed to bring forth a child at 90 years old, with a laugh, she says, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? David in the Psalms asks, why do the wicked prosper and continue to become more powerful and grow old when the rest of us are having such a tough time? Come on, Naomi asked the question, why call me Naomi? Her, her name meant pleasant. But in the face of the death of her husband and the death of her two adult sons, she says, change my name to Myra, which means Bitter. You know why? Because the Lord has afflicted me, she said. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. She's pushing back against God. She's raising questions. Come on. Habakkuk said, oh, Lord, how long must I cry? Uh, even cry of violence, and you will not save in the midst of a time and a season of injustice when it looked like the righteous was being overcome by the unrighteous, Rebecca had questions. The disciples had questions when Jesus calmed the, the storm in the, in the Gennesaret Lake. Man, they looked around and they said, what man of man is this? That even the winds and the waves will listen to him. They're questioning, who is this one? Call Jesus. And when Jesus is dying on the cross, he quotes one scripture. And it's a question. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Don't you get it? The Bible beckons, invites us to be thoughtful and rigorous and to bring our questions, guys. And so Mary, when her life is interrupted by the angel, it's disrupted by this new assignment that shows up. You know what? How does she respond? She responds like you and I would. She asks questions. How can this thing happen, considering who I am, considering that I'm a virgin? I don't understand this. It's not blind faith. It's faith that begins with questions. Questions, curiosity, wondering. You know, a number of years ago when I was pastoring in Boston, one of my members, a wonderful, faithful member, daughter ended up being brutally murdered. I went to see her at home and went back in the back room where she was basically confined to the bed with grief. She looked up and she said to me, 
I don't understand this. I prayed for my kids, all of my kids, including the daughter. God's divine protection for days and weeks and months and years. God lets this happen? How do you explain that, Pastor? And I said to her, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for that question. I'm talking about living through certain seasons of life, trusting God in the midst of unanswered questions, that's one right there. And I said to her, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I have no answer for this, exp- this level of expression of evil in the world. I said, all I can do is just tell you that the God that we serve knows what it's like to have a son that was murdered because his son was murdered on Calvary's cross. He's with you in your weeping. You see, she was living through a season where she was called upon to trust God in the midst of unanswered questions, but she was not called upon to trust God in the midst of unasked questions. She could ask a question. She's a woman of great faith now, today, many, many years later. And I believe it is so because she did not repress her questions. She raised her questions. She experienced the peace of God in the midst of it even though there remains questions that will yet need to be answered on the other side of eternity. Following Jesus is not a process of blind faith. I like how verse 29 is framed. (laughs) The angel shows up and says, Hey, Mary, you're highly favored. She recognizes she's in the midst of something supernatural. And the verse 29 says this, Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think. You see the words there? To think. She tried to think what the angel could mean. The word to think can be also translated, if you're reading it in the NIV version, it means to wonder. The Greek behind that word simply means to weigh, to ponder. It's an accounting term. It it means to see whether or not everything adds up. It was in that moment, if you, if you could ask Mary, what were you feel? how were you dealing with that? She would say, you know, I was in a moment of wonder. I wonder. It's an appropriate phrase. I wonder. How can this be? Right? What could this angel mean? This doesn't make sense to me supernaturally showing up. Wow. It's awe-invoking. You know, there's two levels of way to think about this word wonder. And I'm going to make this, I'm leaning in here because if you're leading an Explore God group, I'm challenging you. You've got to create space for wonder in that group. So the noun for the word wonder is simply to be in the face of something that is awestruck, that is amazing, that, 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 that blows your mind. Right? It's like watching a beautiful sunrise standing on a Hawaiian island or listening to a fabulous orchestra that moves you to tears. Or maybe it's not the orchestra. Maybe it's listening to the rhythmic, fast-paced, incredible lyrics that's happening in the on-stage production of Hamilton. It's awestruck, right? You go, you wonder. And then... The verb for the word wonder means to be curious. On the positive side, it means to be curious, to, to, to wonder, how does this thing work? Right? It's, it's, I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I'm wow. This is, this is partly where Mary is. It's, it's both awestruck and right. She, she's dealing with something that is beyond. It makes her, in a sense, want to bow in praise. And yet it genders curiosity. How, 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 how does this work? It's incredible on the one hand. It's incredulous on the other hand. Notice both comes from the same root. It's, it's hard to believe. It is so incredible. That's what happens when we deal with God, right? We've got to create space for wonder in our groups. We've got to create space for questions that grow out of wonder, either the curiosity or the awe, the awesomeness of God. So the first misconception is that following Jesus is about blind faith. It isn't. Bring your questions. The second misconception is that 
following Jesus requires the absence of all doubt? And the answer is no. Doubt is a part of the process of faith. You have to welcome doubt in the lives of others, even as you have to permit doubt in your own life. You see, in order to go from one stage of faith to the next stage of faith, you got to work through doubt. Each level requires working through a new level of doubt. Doubt and faith exist together. One of my favorite passages that models this and great stories in the Bible that models this is a story about Thomas and the disciples. You know, the day that Jesus, uh, of Jesus' resurrection that evening, the scripture tells us that uh, 10 of the 11 disciples are in a room. The doors are locked. They are hiding. They're afraid that the Roman soldiers are going to find them and do to them what they did to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, and they had heard that somebody had said that he had risen from the grave. They thought that was crazy. All of a sudden, doors being locked, Jesus appears. They're shocked. Then verse 24 says this. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed Twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. So they told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, oh, no, oh, no. What have you guys been drinking? Oh, no. Is this a game that you guys are trying to play? You're trying to pull something over on me? Oh, no. You're saying he's a liar. Oh, listen, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers in them and the place where they speared him in the side. I want to see that wound as well. I, I, I want to see it. I want to see it. I want to see it. Now, Thomas's response was rational. It was rational. What they were saying to Thomas did not fit with Thomas' understanding of the world, the physical world. When somebody dies, they don't show up in a room. <laughs> there was no historical context for that. And he loved his brothers. Right? These disciples have been together for three and a half years. And he loved Jesus. And my goodness, he really would have loved for that to be true. But he did not have their experience. Their experience of the resurrected Jesus was different from his. He didn't have that experience. And my friends, one's experience matters. So as we think about facilitating our Explore God discussion groups, we want to make those groups safe. We want to make them a space where wonder can take place. Both the awesomeness of God can be revealed and the curiosity that comes from questions can, can roll forth. We also want to make them spaces where we respect that there are different experiences. Experiences. It wasn't that Thomas didn't want to believe he just didn't have that experience. But he was open. Somebody shout, he was open. And then, so let me tell you two ways, uh, some, give you some language to help create safe spaces in your group. Here's the first. My experience is when you're describing your religious experience or your experience about life or whatever the case is, start with this way. My experience is this. Or when you're trying to describe your understanding about a particular scripture or whatever the case might be, my understanding is. So when you say my experience is, my understanding is, you're creating space for there to be a different understanding and for there to be different experiences. It's not the space to try to make sure that we align everybody's experience. No. God shows up in the midst of the diversity of the experience. Notice how the verse continues. Verse 26. Eight days later, the disciples were together. And again, this time Thomas was with them. Now, here's how I know that they respected each other's experience. Notice, Thomas expressed doubt. He said, look, I just can't believe what you guys believe. I don't have that experience and it doesn't comport. Listen, if by some chance I could see what you saw, if I can experience what you experienced, I'm there. They didn't kick Thomas out of the group. They didn't say, turn in your discipleship card, your apostle card. <laughs> they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't, you know, de, you know uh, they, didn't, they didn't remove him from the security lock. 
whatever the case might be. No, he was still with them. Eight days later, he shows up and he's with them. They're still in relationship. There's space for Thomas. And thank God there is. Because here's what happens. Eight days later, he's with them. The doors were locked. And suddenly, Jesus was standing among them, just like before. Peace be with you. And then he says to Thomas, all right, Thomas, put your finger right here. Look at my hands. You see the holes? Come on. You see what's in my side? Don't be faithless any longer. Go ahead. Believe. Touch. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God. Now, all of a sudden, he has experienced the living God. He's felt the breath of Jesus. He's been in the physical presence of Jesus as he's filled that room. And now he can say for himself, yes, he lives. He lives. This is a moment of awe. This is a moment of wonder, isn't it? Wow, wow, it is beyond my ability to articulate. If Thomas was here, it was, it was awestruck. And, and yet it was a moment that engendered even greater curiosity. How can this be? But it is. Oh, I wonder. I wonder how this can be. I, I wonder why I'm in. How is it possible that I'm in this room? I wonder. Do you wonder? A unique place between asking and experiencing. Wonder. That's what we want in our groups. Let me give you one more distinction that I think is extremely important. Thomas did have doubt, but he had what I call open doubt. And I want you to understand there's a difference between open doubt versus closed doubt. Open doubt uh, is uh, it's a doubt that seeks answers. It's, it's somebody who says, I don't understand. This does not comport with my experience. If you can show me, I'm open. This is Mary. This is Thomas. Versus closed doubt. Closed doubt is, 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 a, is when you take a position, it is, is a defense against the possibility of answers. Your, your whole job is to deny the possibility of answers. See, it would have been closed had, had, had Thomas said, I don't really care what happens. I'm not going to believe. As a matter of fact, I ain't even coming back. I, 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 I don't even, you try to pull that on me. Just forget it. I'm out of here. Close, close. The other day I was leaving uh, the church office and I ran across a fellow that was standing there. And he asked about some water. And I told him, yeah, we'd facilitate that. And, and, uh, and as I got ready to move towards the car, he said to me, hey, so what's the word, Pastor? And I said, hey, the Lord is good. And before I knew it, he was quoting scripture, rejecting that and, and wanted to get into an argument. And I just blessed him and kept moving because, you know, I recognized that was closed doubt. See, I explore God discussion groups are not places for arguing back and forth. That's not what we're trying to do. It's not a space for closed doubt. It's a space for people who wonder comes into spaces. I wonder. I wonder about your experience. I want to share my experience. I wonder. I wonder if there's some answers to this question. I wonder. I wonder. I want to hear what you have to share. I want to share. We want to pray together. We want to think together. It's not going to be people who all think alike. Not even everybody got to be a Christian. Not even the person who leads got to be a Christian. You just got to be. You got to have open doubt. Yeah, that's what we invite. Open doubt. Come saying, I wonder. All right, here's the final misconception, just in case you've missed it. First is, Christianity is not about blind faith. It welcomes questions. God engages us in our questions. Secondly, it does not require the absence of all doubt. So often faith and doubt rooms together in the same room, but you want to have open doubt. The thirdly, this misconception that faith happens all at once, you know, it is fully formed all at once. Oh, it's nothing. And I want to return now to Mary. And she just models for us the fact is that, that, that faith, at the end of the day, uh, faith happens. Uh, rather, let me say it like this. Faith grows at different speeds for different people. Or I say it like this. Faith happens in stages. Ultimately, Christian faith requires a total surrender of our lives. And I don't know anyone who went from zero faith to total surrender. I mean, fully total surrender. We may have thought that was the case overnight. Because it just doesn't happen that way. Usually it's in stages. 
Let's look at the stages of faith in Mary's response to, to the gospel, to the good news that the angel was declaring to her that, that in fact she would actually bring forth into the world. First, she responds thoughtfully. I told you that the word to think, to ponder, to wonder was simply a, a curious wonder, right? It was, it was to weigh. It was to see how things added up. It was to be honest about how bizarre and awe-stricken and crazy this was. And yet it was happening. And she's thinking it through. She's trying to add it up thoughtfully. And she has her question. Verse 34, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? Don't you know I'm a virgin? Explain the biology, the science. I don't get it. And the angel says, well, listen, what's going to happen is going to define biology and science as you know it. The Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. And, 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 be, and in that process, you will conceive in your womb and a miracle will take place. Oh, she says. Then Mary responds gradually. She moves from this notion of, wow, this is crazy. This is like, I, I, am I hallucinating? Is this a dream? Okay, okay, I'm trying to, figure, trying to hear this. To her ultimately saying, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And when she says this, she's not saying, I fully understand, I fully get it. She's just saying, okay, I'm available. I'm ready, to, I'm willing to pursue. I, I'm I'm. I'll accept the assignment as it comes. We have to come to a place of acceptance. And then finally she responds with wonder. She's told by the angel, I know you need a little proof. You need some experience to go along with this dialogue. So you know your cousin? She's been barren all her life. She's now up in age, beyond childbearing age. Check it out. Go find her. Go to her house. You'll discover she's six months pregnant. The text says a few days later, Mary turned, uh, excuse me, Mary uh, hurried to the hill country. Verse 39, to the town where Zachariah, that's Elizabeth's husband, lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, she was six months pregnant at the time with John the Baptist, says that the child leaped within her. And, and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can just imagine that shouting and celebration started to happen. And that was the physical experience to confirm for Mary that the promise was real. The promise was real. That was the wonder. Yeah, I close this by thinking about, you know, when I was a teenager... Those of you who are my age or older, and if you're from the South, you know that we used to have revival meetings. We used to have a mourner's bench there in the front, and you'd have to go sit on that mourner's bench seeking the salvation for your soul, that assurance that God's grace had claimed you. You're supposed to have a praying ground, and during the day you'd be praying and seeking, and you'd come back on the morning. I thought it was humiliating, and I didn't want to do it, but ultimately at some point my grandma says, you, you're going to have to do it. And so in response to that, I sit on that bench. And throughout the worship service, you'd get on your knees and people would come around you and they'd pray that God would save you and deliver you. And the power of the prayer was so powerful that ultimately my heart melted. And back in that day, they would teach you that you needed a sign. And I, I, I thought this was ridiculous in my young adult life. You needed a sign, something to grab hold to. And so the sign that I was looking for to so that I could know that Jesus had to use the language that at the time saved me, that grace had claimed me, was that I had said, look, I'm in control of my emotions. If you can make me cry, then I'll know that's the case. And I remember Friday night. It was the last night of the revival. Everybody had gone forth and accepted Jesus. I was still sitting on the bench by myself. My granduncle said, if you believe, walk from that bench to the chair. And I was still waiting on God to make me cry. That was my sign. It didn't come. So I decided to take a step of faith, and I walked, and I took the chair. And when I sat down in the chair, it was like the heavens opened up, and the Spirit of God fell on me. And the next thing I knew, floods and floods of tears came. It would take some years for me to figure out the importance of that. See, what the older people knew then that I didn't know is that there would come, a there would come times in my life 
that I would do mess up in some really bad ways. And I would need to remember that experience when Jesus' grace claimed me. And I would know I would have an experience to, to, to reinforce my faith that nothing I could do would separate me from the love of God. He had me. There would come other moments when I would be living in a world where thousands, tens of thousands of people would die in Morocco and Libya, and it would raise all kinds of questions. I would, I would wonder along with you, and, but I would remember the experience and be reminded of the realness of God and his grace that has claimed me that I am proclaiming. And the lesson was, sometimes, Herman, you're going to have to step forward in faith And the confirmation comes later. It served me well throughout this life. My prayer is for everybody who participates in our Explore God's groups. And by the time you get to the seventh week, that you will have your own encounter, your own experience with Jesus. That will initiate whatever st- the next stage is of your faith. It'll keep you in those days when you have to move forward trusting God in the midst of unanswered questions. As you walk in wonder. Amen. Amen. And amen. Listen. Um, I want to challenge you. We're going to throw it up on the screen. I'm going to challenge you. If you're not leading a discussion group, I want to challenge you to go to our website, sign up, become a part of this movement, create space in your life for wonder. I end with this text. As Mary said in that beautiful Magnifica, here's what she said. Ultimately, she responds in wonder. She says this. Uh, my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Isn't that it? At the end of the day, that's one day at its best, isn't it? She said, I can't believe it. But he chose me. That's me. I can't believe it. But he's working through me. He wants to do it through you. So may we surrender. May we trust. And may we continue to wonder. Amen. Amen.